Captain, I should like to take you back again over one or two points that the jury may think require a little clarification. Reed's collecting the betting slips from the building sites. Is that a normal sort of procedure for the men who work in the building industry? When you're working out of town, yes. And you suspected that Reed was not, in fact, taking the slips to a betting office, but, in fact, running a book himself. How could he do that? Well, he'd know what everybody was betting and what the winners came to. <clears throat> so it wouldn't have taken him a couple of weeks to work out that he could make a hundred or more running the book himself. Now, what you're suggesting is that of, say, a hundred and fifty pounds bet, only fifty pounds would be returned in winnings in an average week. That's right. Yet you continued to bet with him. Oh, well, it didn't make no difference who the book he was. I mean, whether it was Reed or some tough accountant. What caused the argument, then? Well, when it came to the big win, he wouldn't pay out. See, I was due me 80-odd quid in a treble, and he tried to give me me slip back and said that he hadn't had time to go to the betting shop. And you didn't believe him? Well, he always had time to go to the betting shop when I lost, didn't he? And is that where the argument of the public house was about? Yeah, it was. Well, that and the load splitting. But the betting, mostly. You didn't feel strongly about the load splitting that particular evening? Oh, no, it's all I just wanted me winnings. And then I take it the vandalism at your home was, your, was the final straw? Yeah, it was. I said to me brother, it was time we stopped messing about and went to the police. How did he react to that? Oh, well, he's a great blatherer. He was still on for talking it out with the fella, and he said we'd given him till Tuesday to settle up the betting money, so in the end, well, I let him go over to Reed's. And then after your brother Martin had engaged Reed on his doorstep, exactly what happened? Well, I was watching from the window, and I heard this noise. I saw Johnson creeping up the side with a gun. I said, they got to have that old plan. They wanted our Martin to go round there and start an argument so they could lay hold of him from the back. So what did you do? Well, I pushed my way to the hedge and I laid hold of him. What was Johnson doing at this point? He was pointing the gun at my brother. And? Well, I tried to get it off him, but he fired it. He fired it? Deliberately? Well, I think he was trying to scare me off, but it must have been the first shot that got Reed. What makes you say that? Well, if it wasn't that shot, he'd have hardly hung around waiting for another while we were struggling, would he? Then the gun went off again? I, yeah, I had him on the ground then, and it must have gone off by accident. I see. Now, is there any truth in the allegation that you and your brother then proceeded to kick Johnson in the head? Oh, none at all, so we went straight back to the house. Knowing that Reed had been shot and perhaps killed? No, 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 we didn't even know he'd been hit. You see... Well, he'd moved back into the house a bit when, when uh, the fight started and where I ended up on the ground, well, I was out of sight of that. Thank you, Mr Thornton. Miss Tate. Mr Thornton, you've stated that it was your belief that Reed was operating as a bookmaker rather than placing the bets with a betting shop. Now, I wonder, therefore, why you did not make some other arrangements. Well, it didn't make no difference who the bookie was, so long as the winnings were paid out. Perhaps not, but it is illegal. Why did you not report it to the police? Why should we? He always paid up till he came to the big win. But if what you're saying is true, then Reed was making a profit of a hundred pounds a week. Now, why should he refuse to pay this eighty-odd pounds and so ruin what must have been a most lucrative enterprise for himself? Because he thought he could pull a fast one and get away with it. Now, you left the public house at more or less the same time as Reed and Johnson. How was it then that you arrived at Cromwell Crescent some half an hour later? Well, I don't know what time they left, do I? Anyway, we had our marbles and she w doesn't walk so fast. And you'd had a lot to drink, too. No, we didn't. We'd, we'd only a drop taken. You didn't perhaps make your own separate way home? Separate, that is, from your brother Martin and your mother, perhaps? I did not. Well, I suggest that you had ample time to collect such a weapon in that half hour that elapsed after you left the public house. So that a rubbish. Well, where was the gun, then? In your house all the time? I told you. I sold him months before. Did you have a license for this gun you claim to have sold? No. Did the person you claim to have sold it to have a license? And how should I know? Because the law requires that you know. Do you know the name of the person you claim to have sold this gun to? Yes. Michael. Michael... Um, I can't think of a second name. Because you never sold that gun at all, did you? And it was, as Mrs. Gorman has testified, in your house that evening until it was used to cruelly maim Alexander Reed. It was not. I sold it months before. Without its case to a complete stranger? It wasn't a complete stranger. It was one of the boys in the site. Well, do you honestly believe that the court will accept that? That you 
in a legal possession of a weapon, sold it to someone whose name you cannot remember, and you forgot to put it in its case. Well, that's the truth. No, the truth is that that was the weapon used that evening, and that was the weapon hidden in your mother's bed. And why was the gun cleaning equipment found under the stairs? For the simple reason that it was too bulky to be hidden under the mattress. Now, that's the truth, isn't it? Not at all. No further questions, my lord. No re-examination, my lord. We'll now return to the dock. That concludes the case for the defence. <clears throat> Miss Tate. Members of the jury, I believe there is only one matter on which this issue rests, and that is the ownership of the weapon used to assault Alexander Reed. It is my submission that the weapon was owned and used by the defendants Martin and Gerald Thornton. Mrs. Gorman saw the weapon in the house immediately after the assault, and the police, although failing to recover it, did find gun cleaning equipment and a case there. Furthermore, the Thornton brothers have admitted possessing such a weapon, possessing it indeed illegally, and then expect us to believe that they sold it to some person whose name they cannot remember, sold it without its gun cleaning equipment and case. Now, the defense have suggested that the weapon was owned and used by William Johnson, but they have, proved, they have no evidence to prove this, nor is there evidence to suggest that Johnson had motivation to commit such a crime, as he'd only recently arrived in the Reed household and had no personal argument with the Thornton brothers himself. The Thornton brothers, on the other hand, have produced three reasons for their acts of criminal violence. One, the alleged load splitting. Secondly, the illegal bookmaking. And thirdly, the vandalism to their property. Now, there remains still the question of intention, and it is my submission that this has been clearly demonstrated not only by their behavior, but by their reported remarks. Firstly, in the public house, we'll finish you. And then, immediately prior to the assault, let's finish this bloody thing once and for all. Members of the jury. It is my contention that the Thornton brothers had the motivation, the means, and the intention to commit this criminal act of violence. And that being so, I believe that you have no alternative but to find them both guilty of the charge of attempted murder. Mr. Lotter. Hello. Members of the jury, the prosecution makes much of this empty gun case with this cleaning kit. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I ask you, if the defendants were guilty, wouldn't they have disposed of all traces of ever having owned a firearm? They had over an hour before the police arrived. Now, Mrs. Gorman says that she saw a gun in the Thornton's house. She didn't tell the police this, but this is what she now tells us. Now, I wonder what made her change her story. Ladies and gentlemen, do you believe that Mrs. Gorman, rushing to the Thorntons for shelter, comfort, solace, believed that they had been responsible for shooting Reed? Or don't you rather believe that she went there for protection from the man she knew had shot him, William Johnson? And Johnson took over an hour to call the police after his friend had been shot down. There was ample time to dispose of a weapon. I put it to you that it was this man, a man who was Reed's bodyguard, a man with a long record of criminal violence, a man who was angry and who'd been drinking. It was this man who, in the mistaken impression that he was protecting his employer, took the shotgun from the padlock coal store and, in the scuffle that followed, accidentally shot him. Members of the jury, you must find the defendants not guilty. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, as both the prosecution and defense counsel have so rightly stressed, the first point for you to decide is who possessed the weapon and who wielded it during the course of this doorstep argument. And I must direct you that if there is any reasonable doubt in your minds that one or other of the defendants did possess and wield this weapon, then you must return a verdict of not guilty. And you must remember 
that it is not for the defense to prove their case, but for the Crown to prove the case against them. Now, the law states that an, an attempted murder is any mortal assault which, had it resulted in death, would have been murder. Now, if you consider that the Thorntons did possess this weapon, you may nonetheless still wish to judge the evidence against them separately. Since uh, for the case to be proven against both defendants, you would have to decide that both brothers went to Reed's house with a common intention and a common criminal purpose. Of course, if you are satisfied that such was the case, then you will find them both guilty. Uh, but, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, you may feel that the elder brother, Martin Thornton, was not involved and that uh, he was ignorant of his brother's activities and took no other part than that of simple assault. And uh, under these circumstances, uh, you may consider that a reduced finding against Martin Thornton uh, might be appropriate. Uh, but, members of the jury, should you make this reduced finding against Martin Thornton, and should you, at the same time, still be convinced in your own minds that Gerald Thornton did possess and wield the weapon, then it would still be open to you to find General Thornton alone guilty of attempted murder. Now, members of the jury, you will kindly retire and consider your verdict. All stand. The prisoners will remain standing. Members of the jury, will your foreman please stand? Answer this question, yes or no. Have you reached verdicts for both defendants on which you're all agreed? Yes. Do you find the defendant Martin Thornton guilty or not guilty of attempted murder? Guilty. Is that the verdict of you all? It is. Do you find the defendant Gerald Thornton guilty or not guilty of attempted murder? Guilty. Is that the verdict of you all? It is. Come on. Martin and Gerald Thornton. Mr. Justice Waddington sentenced Martin and Gerald Thornton to eight years' imprisonment for the attempted murder of their next-door neighbour. Next week, a chance for you to join another jury in assessing the facts when our cameras return to watch another leading case in the Crown Court. <laughs>